Dan Cordopassi of TSG Multimedia. Welcome to Model Railroading 101. As usual, I'm in front of the camera and John is behind the camera making everything look good. I'm still in class. Yep. So last time we talked about tools and this time we're gonna continue our discussion about tools. And like I said before, most people have tools laying around the house, but tools that are good for working on full-size projects aren't always good for working on small-scale models. You mean I can't do an oil change on my N-scale locomotive? <laughs> yeah, probably not. Darn! Yeah. So, as usual, this is an overview, and we're going to just hit the highlights and talk about some of the most common tools. Um, as to what tools you need, it kind of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And like in our last episode, I've broken things down by specific types of tasks. Yeah, and it makes can, sense. Yeah, it makes sense that way. Yeah. Um, and as I said last time, it really pays to have good quality tools. Uh, cheap tools tend to wear out, not do a very good job. A good tool will last a really long time and definitely will pay for itself in the long run. So let's get started. In the model railroad world, there are basically two types of electrical work. There's the very small stuff that goes inside locomotives, rolling stock, and structures. And then there's the larger stuff that powers the layout. Oh, right. In both cases, it's good to have some basic electrical tools. Small wire cutters like these mm -hmm. are essential, as is a small gauge wire stripper. Mm -hmm. This one does 22 gauge to 30 gauge, which is oh, very useful. That's really small. Yeah. Usually the ones you find in a hardware store do bigger gauge wire, which is also sometimes useful on a layout um, for running like, you know, DCC bus wires or something, you want to use larger gauge wire for yeah. that. But I think the ones in the hardware store are geared toward in-house electrical work. Right. That's usually like bigger than 22 gauge. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The same needle nose pliers that um, you can use for track work and other things also really come in handy for electrical work too. We saw those last episode, didn't we? We did. I thought so, they looked familiar. The same exact pair. A pencil type soldering iron around 25 watts is perfect for working on model railroad items. That's the larger one here. Okay, in the um, middle. Yeah, the smaller one's even lower wattage, which is good for really, really tiny stuff. I should get one of those for N-scale stuff. Yeah. Um, also, you always want to make sure to use rosin core solder for electronics when you're working on model train stuff. Uh, don't use acid core solder. Okay. Uh, why is that? Because uh, it can damage the electronics. Oh. Yeah. Well, don't, 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 don't do that. Yeah. So this is a little soldering iron cleaner. It looks like a bowl of steel wool that's made <laughs> out of gold. Yeah. Um, you can also use a, a damp sponge, but it's good every time you use the iron to just clean it off. Oh, I see. It scrapes off the excess, eh? Yeah, it gets all of that black carbon deposit stuff off of it. In certain situations, a resistance soldering set might be useful. Um, especially like if you're working on a brass locomotive or something. Uh, the advantage this has is it applies heat only in a very specific location. Uh -huh. So you don't end up unsoldering a bunch of other stuff while you're trying to solder yeah. the part you're working on. Yeah, that happened to me once. Yeah. What do you use a Buck Rogers laser gun for? <laughs> <laughs> this is another type of soldering iron. This is a, a trigger type. And uh, this is actually a higher wattage than the little pencil ones. Um, yeah. I wouldn't use these to like put a decoder in an engine or something. It's way too overkill hot for that. Yeah. But in certain situations on a layout, you might once in a while need one of these. A multimeter is a really good tool for uh, testing and troubleshooting. Oh, yes. I've seen you use this a lot. Yeah. This can measure voltage and also resistance. Um, this is an old one. They actually have newer ones now that are all digital and fancier. But either way, um, it's a really good tool to have just to check, like, if you're not sure that a certain track is actually getting power sure. or whatever, you can you can use one of these and kind of, you know, figure out what's going on. How about isolating the motor when you're installing DCC in a really old locomotive? That too. Yeah. Yeah, you can use it for all kinds of things. It's extremely useful. This could save you hundreds of dollars on burnt up decoders. Yeah, or car insurance. <laughs> So here's a little improvised tool that I made. It's just a 9-volt battery holder and a 9-volt battery um, with some alligator clips. And then right here I have a resistor soldered in there. I don't remember exactly how much. It's probably like a 1K ohm. Um, and I use it to test LEDs. 
So this is one of those larger wire strippers that you can typically find at most hardware stores. Mm -hmm. And in addition to doing larger wire gauge sizes, one thing I like about it is that it has a crimper tool. And if you're using um, those little spade lugs that you put on screw terminals mm -hmm. and you want to crimp them onto wire, this is great for that. If you're using fiber optics and you want to make lenses like I usually do for my models, a lighter or a candle is a really good heat source. So what about the models themselves? One of the first tools I remember being thrilled to get as a kid was an X-Acto knife. Yeah, you just wanted to cut stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like I'd moved up in the modeling world when I got one of those. I was like, ooh, now I can really do something. Congratulations, you've gained a level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it's such an essential tool that I can't really imagine trying to model anything without one. Um, one thing that's important is to make sure to keep a supply of sharp blades because mm -hmm. they get dull quickly and they should be replaced often. Um, and there are a variety of blade styles available for different jobs. Uh, the two that I use the most are the number 11 blade, which is on the silver knife. That's just kind of for general purpose work. Yep, that's what you'd see. Any, if you went anywhere and said, I need a hobby knife, that's what they'll give you. Right. And then I, I the other one I use a, a lot is the number 17 blade, which is on the black knife. Mm -hmm. um, that's good for chiseling things. So this is another improvised tool. Small pieces of wire left over from other projects make really good glue applicators. Ah, the old brass wire trick. Right. As I call it every time I see you do it. Yeah. So generally I've found that uh, for good looking models, it's best to use as little glue as possible and to apply it very precisely. Um, this is really good for like CA type glues. Uh -huh. And I just put a little drop on the end of this and then I can stick the glue exactly where I need it. It's really a lot more... Uh, control that way than trying to use the glue bottle and shove it somewhere <laughs> and then have it splatter out yeah or shoot out right <laughs> i think i had this razor saw in the last episode i think you had the miter box on the last episode too yeah it was a stand-in but a small miter box like this and a razor saw are really good for cutting uh small material like little pieces of tubing or pieces of styrene yeah um, i've seen you use this little setup many times yeah so this is a really handy thing to have Come to think of it, I think I saw these last time too. Yeah, these are files that I was saying work well for uh, doing track work, but they're also really good for working on models. Uh huh. Um, you can use them for all kinds of filing and you know rounding little corners and things like that. Cleaning up flash, right? If you're doing a kit, right? Fine grade sandpapers are really useful too. Um, for modeling, I find that uh, 220 grit, 320, 400, and 600 grit are the most useful. Mm -hmm. um, also, I like to buy my sandpaper in a hardware store or automotive store rather than a hobby shop because you get more for your money. It comes in, you know, larger sheets. Yeah, you can just cut them, right? Right. And what I do is I cut them down into little pieces like this, and then I label them on the back so I know what it is. Yeah. And then what I like to do is I take little scraps of 040 styrene, and I use those as a makeshift sanding block. I'll do is this, fold this over put it around there and that makes a neat little sanding block. So they make some little like sanding sticks and things specifically for modeling, but I've never actually used any of those. Oh, I find that my little sanding block idea works pretty well for most situations. Plus I would imagine if they're made specifically for modeling, they're probably expensive. Yeah. In our episode on standards, we talked about coupler height gauges and the NMRA standards gauge. Sure did. I would definitely include those on my list of tools for working on rolling stock and locomotives. Sure. Um, if you want to see more about how these are used, watch our Model Railroading 101 episode on standards. Okay. Trip pin pliers are special pliers that are specifically designed for adjusting the trip pins on model railroad couplers. Uh -huh. So, you know, they fit and you can just squeeze them and raise oh. it. Oh, so that it has a curved side, doesn't it? Right. So if it needs to go higher, you use it this way. If it needs to go lower, you turn it around and use it that way. So we already talked about needle nose pliers, but there are actually a couple different kinds. Smooth jawed pliers, like these, don't have any teeth. And those are good in some situations, especially if you're holding a little part that you don't want to mark up. Sure. Um, other ones have little serrations, and those are good for uh, getting a better grip on something. They also come in different sizes. These are sprue cutters, and these are a special kind of cutter that's designed to remove plastic parts from the trees that come in many kits. Oh, right. We've seen you use these a lot. Yeah. 
Uh, these are a great way to get parts loose without damaging them. Um, just be sure not to use the cutters for anything but plastic because it'll ruin the jaws. Tweezers are great for holding small parts. Mm -hmm. These are just regular tweezers, and then these are sprung tweezers. And the sprung tweezers are kind of cool because they'll hold parts without any additional effort. You just stick something in there. Oh, right. So if you need to solder a wire or something like yeah. that, right? Yeah. I also find them really useful for painting, which is why these are all painted up. <laughs> oh, on the tips. Yeah, I see that now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I also call these holder things. Yeah, holder things. That's, that works. A small vise is also good for holding parts. This one has a vacuum base so that it can be secured to most flat surfaces. Mm -hmm. Works pretty well. Has to be a smooth surface too, not just flat. Yeah, like it wouldn't work too well in this fuzzy thing we've got on our studio table here. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> a set of small screwdrivers is really good for working on models. There's a lot of the screws that are in the you know, locomotives and cars are way too small for like hardware store screwdrivers. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. This is one set. This has uh, several flathead sizes and then a couple of small Phillips. Yeah. You know, I've seen these little, they're little cases. You usually get them for working on eyeglasses. Yeah. That has little screwdrivers. They look different from this. They have little metal handles. Yeah. I got a whole bunch of those all yeah. around. There's, there's different kinds, but yeah, having something like this is really a good thing to have in your toolbox. So if you need to make holes for screws, having some small size drill bits and like pin vices like these are good for making holes. And then you can have a, a tap and a tap wrench for actually cutting threads All right. in the holes. Uh, this is a 256 tap. And the counterpart to a tap is a die, which is one of these. And this will actually cut threads onto a rod. Oh, I see. So if you wanted to fabricate something like a piece of rod that you needed to put threads in the end to screw into something... You could use one of these. And this this actually is in a, a special wrench for the die, too, mm -hmm. to give you more leverage. So that would be as you're, you're making, basically, you're making a machine screw thread. Right. To go into a machine screw thread, thread hole. Right. Foam cradles are good for holding models upside down. Um, just be careful if the model has a lot of details on it, not to snag the details on the foam when you're putting it in the cradle or taking it out. You can see us use these every single week on our product reviews. Yeah. So we talked about this in the last episode when I was talking about tools to work on track. Uh -huh. uh, it's a motor tool. But this is so useful, I wanted to bring it back because it's also really useful when working on models. Um, there's cutting attachments, there's grinding attachments, and sure. brushes and all kinds of things that can uh, make a job easier. I mentioned last time, and I'll mention it again, especially if you're using something like this little wire brush here. Yeah. Wear eye protection always with something like this. Yeah, for sure. Because those little wire brushes can uh, let the little wires go and they become little tiny projectiles. Plus, you look pretty cool with glasses on. Yeah. So a self-healing cutting mat like this one or a tempered glass cutting surface uh, is good when cutting sheet plastic or other materials. How about decals? It could be good for that too. Yeah. So this was in the last episode also, but I'm bringing it back because this is a model railroad reference rule. And what's cool about this is it has uh, scale feet dimensions in all of the major scales. So this saves you from having to get your calculator out and saying, well, what's 1 87th of an inch? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So if you want to measure an HO scale feet, you just read it right here. It's got O scale feet on the other side. Um, depending on how you read it, it also does S on that side mm -hmm. and it's got N on the back. Yep. So, um, yeah, one of these is really, really useful. Also makes a good straight edge. For painting models, I usually use an airbrush for large areas and small brushes for small areas. Um, paint brushes can also be useful for weathering. So these, these little tiny brushes are really good for fine detail work. Uh-huh. Like glad hands, right? Yeah. Or if you want to like paint the fuel filler red on an engine or something. Um, larger brushes I usually use for weathering. Mm -hmm. I don't brush paint models. I think it looks terrible. I don't think I've ever seen a brush painted model that looked good. Yeah. The only, the only time you can really get away with that, I think, is maybe if you have a wood structure, because the wood grain will absorb some of the paint and you don't get such obvious brush strokes. There are basically two kinds of airbrushes, uh, internal mix and external mix. Some hobby magazines will tell you that the external mix type is easier to use, but I find the opposite to be true. Hmm. 
probably um, just depends who writes the article. Maybe. Yeah, I find that the external mix kind are very fussy and very hard to get to work well. Uh, one thing that's essential for airbrush work is a good compressor. And I would avoid the small compressors that you see for sale in hobby shops and go to the hardware store. Get a compressor with a reservoir tank and a pressure gauge. Um, the pressure gauge is really useful because you can dial the exact amount of pressure that you need. Mm -hmm. Usually for airbrushing models, it's around 25 PSI, something like that. And the reservoir tank is important because um, compressors without a tank actually create a pulsating airflow. So it can lead to uneven paint coverage because you're getting these little puffs of air rather than a steady stream. The tank is like a big buffer, and it gives a very smooth airflow. So um, that's really important. And if you live in a climate with a lot of moisture um, or humidity, you might want to invest in a moisture trap, hmm. which uh, dries the air, basically. It's also good to have a large tank because if you have a small tank and the compressor turns on to re pressurize the tank uh -huh. it scares the crap out of you yeah, yeah. this is the detail associates so cleaning an airbrush is very important so after every painting session i like to disassemble it and clean it out and these little uh, bottle brushes mm -hmm. are really good for that especially this little tiny one which you can you know run through the air passages and you know with some thinner on it and clean it all out. Are those made with wire brush or? Um, it just a I think they're nylon bristles, but the they're on a wire, um, you know, stick. Stick. Yeah. Eyedroppers like this are really good for uh, mixing paint, uh, especially when you're airbrushing. A lot of times you have to add thinner to the paint. Sure, in small amounts, right? In small amounts, yeah. Also good for creating uh, washes if you want to add thinner to paint to create washes for using with brushes. Yep. And this is just a piece of aluminum rod. I got this from the hardware store in a little package of like six of these. Um, and I use them as paint stirrers. Oh, right. Yeah. I, I suppose you could use coffee stir sticks too, huh? Yeah, you could. I, I like using metal because I know that the metal isn't going to uh, interact with the paint. Right. It'll Whereas, soak up if it's a wooden thing. If it's wood, yeah. Or, or if it's plastic, it might start to dissolve depending on what kind of paint you have. E. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I have a, a Dan secret for all the viewers out there. For years and years and years, he was using the back of an old file as his paint stir stick. Yep. And we have some examples of that. <laughs> oh, look at that. So micro brushes are really good for um, applying like weathering powder or pastels. Sure. Even paint in some cases. Even huh? paint in some cases. Yeah. This... This style here is more like a disposable paintbrush, which you use just like any other paintbrush. And then these have little puff balls on the end, which are really good for powders. And they come in different sizes. Something else I've seen you do with these was to put alcohol on them to take numbers off of, off of yeah, models. Right? They can be used for that too. To, to renumber a locomotive, for example, or patch out a right. box, box car or something like that. Right. You can use it to apply solvent and things like that in very, uh, con in a very controlled way. That one looks like a piece of cheesecake. <laughs> yeah, these are uh, actually foam. Cheesecake. Very, very squishy. Cheesecake. It's not cheesecake. It looks like I cheesecake. I don't think it would taste very good. Well, I don't disagree with that, <laughs> but, but it does look like cheese. A really small piece of cheesecake. Yeah. It's, it's like a bite size. Yeah, for so you don't have to blow your diet. Um. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> tangents, Dan, tangents. Yeah. Anyway, uh, these are foam applicators, uh, mostly for pan pastels, which are uh, for weathering. Mm -hmm. But you could probably use them with powders or other things, too. Uh, hey, Dan. Yeah? I thought this is a video about modeling. It is. This is barbecue tongs. <laughs> no. Right? Oh, it's not? Well, I, yeah, I don't think it will work too well for that. Oh, okay. Because um, it has foam on it. <laughs> this, this is actually a, a, a painting handle. A painting handle with yeah. old stuff in it or yeah what it does is you put this inside like a locomotive or a um, boxcar oh, or something and these yeah. foam things grip it from the inside uh -huh. and the screw is to adjust the tension so it's not too tight that is a very clever now that you explained how it's used i can totally see yeah. that you just put it up inside the shell yeah and this is clean enough that you know that i haven't actually used this one yet um <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you normally, you usually just use your hand, right, with a glove on? I usually, yeah, I usually put um, disposable gloves on and just hold stuff yeah. like that. Seems like you'd um, have better control with your hand. Another thing that's really good if you're going to do airbrushing or even um, using spray cans uh, is a spray booth. Oh, yeah. And I have one that's a little, uh, it's actually somewhat portable. You can fold it up and pack it away pretty in a pretty small area. But it has a little exhaust fan, and it carries the fumes away. So the idea is if you're using it indoors, you would put the hose that comes off the back of it through a window or sliding glass door right. or something that, like that. That way it bothers your neighbors instead of you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a static grass applicator is needed if you want to use static grass, which stands up and looks really realistic. A spray bottle is good for wedding scenery before you glue it. I was going to say a, a wedding scene? No. <laughs> like a bride and a groom? Don't you need a little cake for that too? No, and you, usually most scenery stuff, you have to get it wet first and then you use like an eyedropper right. to apply glue. Um, and then because it's already wet, the glue will spread through it. Right. And then when it, when it dries, it's all fixed in place rather than being loose. If you're using foam to build scenery, a hot wire or bladed cutting tool can make the job less messy than using a serrated knife or other mechanical tool. Uh, be sure to use a respirator or work outside since the fumes can be toxic. So there's some other tools that um, I haven't mentioned related to a specific task, but can still be useful. Uh, one of those is a postal scale. I use these sometimes, aside from product reviews, but to weigh rolling stock to see, you know, if it's up to the NMRA recommended weight or whatever weight, you know, if you prefer to, your cars to be heavier, you know, you still need to weigh them to figure out how much you need to add or whatever. Yeah. Maybe you want all of your rolling stock to weigh a specific amount, regardless of what it is. Right. Because it may track better. Right. There's different ways to do it. But in any case, you need to have some, some way to measure it. So a force gauge is used to tell you how much pulling power a locomotive has. And this is the actual force gauge. And then this is nothing but a bent paper clip that I made a little hook on one end so that I can hook it to a coupler. So this is a wheel puller or gear puller. Yep. And this is useful for regaging wheels or installing or removing gears for motor shafts. Yes, I've seen you do both of the above. Yeah, so it has this little plate for stuff that's smaller than this big opening here. You just basically put a wheel in there and then turn this crank Right. Until it's against the axle and then keep turning it and it'll force the wheel to move. Yep. Or force the axle to move, right? Force the axle to move, yeah. So if you, if this wheel set was out of gauge, this would be one way to put it back in gauge. So a magnifying glass can be useful for seeing small details. You there don't are, say. Yeah. There are also uh, wearable ones uh -huh. that um, have lenses and some people like to use those. How are you going to point at this one, Dan? Uh, I'm not. But this is the thing we use as our pointer most of the time is actually an uncoupling tool. Here. Okay. <laughs> it's an uncoupling tool. <laughs> yeah. The wider end actually is useful with HO scale couplers. You can uh, shove it in between, and if you twist it just the right way, it un uncouples the cars. Yes. And the other end is for the shelf type couplers that you see on tank cars sometimes. So they're a little trickier to do, so you need a smaller thing to get in there. And it makes a handy pointer. And it makes a great pointer. Okay, so anyway, hopefully that'll give people a little bit better idea of at least the tools that I use. And uh, if you need to do a project and you don't already have something, you know, maybe point you in the right direction. Yeah. You know, it's funny. When we started talking about, you know, considering doing this as a topic for this series, I thought to myself, oh, well, that's going to be a short little show you know i didn't think it was going to even be two episodes but there are so many tools and you don't think about it until you see them all right you know, and so many different things that you have to do right well that's one of the things that uh, at least for me keeps model railroading interesting is that there are so many different types of jobs and so many different skill sets to yeah. master yeah i've often told parents because you know i i have kids in school and i've told parents at school like hey if you want your child to be interested or to learn a bunch of stuff, get them interested in model trains because you have carpentry if you build a layout, you have electronics if you're doing a layout or if you're putting DCC or whatever, mm -hmm. lights or any of that stuff. Right. You have measuring, so you have to use a ruler. You have just all this stuff that you have to know and learn right. to do it. 
So anyway, so what do you think we'll talk about next time? Well, I'm going to talk about uh, transporting models and different types of cases to carry them in. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's one I know that one of our friends has been asking about for a while. So yeah. yeah. Hopefully he won't be absent that day. Hopefully not. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I got to get to class. I'll, I'll see you next time. Okay. See ya.